Del Sergio Show, the mayor of rock and roll. Internet Radio Land. I hope you're staying nice and warm. Uh, well, depending on what part of the world, this is not uh, AM or FM. This is Internet Radio. So we are all over the world. So the part of the world I'm in is very, very cold. <laughs> so I'm sure there's people listening in the uh, somewhere getting a suntan or maybe uh, the different hours or whatever. But anyway, uh, thank you for tuning in to my very first Internet Radio show. Well, I, it's not my first show. I mean, it's my first show as being the host. I've been interviewed on the radio many times, but this time I'm on the other end. And we have an amazing guest, uh, a friend of mine. We've been friends for at least, I think, like 28 years. Something like, like that. Yes, yeah, so I counted that right since 1985. That's about right. We're, yeah, we're giving our age away. So please, everybody, if you're clapping in your living room, please give a warm welcome to my good friend, the one and only Brother Mason Reese. Uncle Sal. <laughs> Brother Mason, how you the doing ma- out there? Man? The, ma- the mayor of rock and roll has his own radio show. I love it. Hey, yeah, man. We're hanging loose like a long-haired goose over here, you know? I love it. I love it. Mason, everybody's very excited. I mean, I posted this uh, show all over the Internet today, and uh, quite a few people has called me up on the phone and saying, Wow, Mason Reese, oh, my God, I remember him. I said, Well, how could you forget Brother Mason? He's been a star since he was a kid, and he's still yeah. a kid. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, that, oh, that, Mason, that, man, that, that gives their age away too, Sal. You know. What? I said anyone that knows who I am, that gives their age away also. <laughs> exactly. Because exactly. I'm old, so there you go. You know. Yeah, we're, we're, we're not that old. I mean, you know, nah, we're not that old. We could still uh, walk without a cane, I guess, as long as yeah, we could, we could still we could still rock and roll. We could still do our thing. That's right. Speaking of rock and roll, you know, uh, Brother Mason is also not only a great actor. And an entrepreneur and a big businessman, but he's also a great, a great musician. Well, I, thank I, you, sir. Thank you. It's been a long time since I played, but uh, you know, it's always in your blood, man. It's always part of you. So, yeah. Absolutely, and hey, Mason. For people out there, you know, there's probably a lot of people that, since I uh, told them about you, they probably looked you up on YouTube and on the internet and all that kind yep. of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the a child actor, like maybe. You give them an idea of, like, how old you were when you did your first commercial? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, I I started when I was four years old. So that was back in 1969. And I uh, I did a commercial for uh, basically an ivory snow soap detergent, like a laundry detergent. And I was four years old, but I had an uncanny ability at the age of four where I could take a script and I could memorize it backwards and forwards at the age of four. And not only did I look younger than four, but I was very small, but I was very precocious and I was very talkative. And uh, I booked a commercial. I beat out 800 other kids to uh, do that commercial. And ultimately, that led to probably the biggest commercial I ever did, which was for uh, a company called Underwood Deviled Ham. And uh, I did a bunch of campaigns for them, one of which ran for about five years. And that's when all the talk shows called me up and wanted me to come on and talk about my life and my experiences and write a book and be on the cover of TV Guide and get to do all kinds of crazy, wild things. Oh, yeah, you definitely, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you, you to get, be on the cover of the TV Guide, that, that's superstardom, you know. The only superstars end up on the cover of TV Guide. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's funny, Sal, because, you know, the kids today, they don't even know what the hell a TV guide is, you know. But but people who do know, know really how big it was. And, you know, if you were on the cover of TV Guide, especially a solo cover, just you on the cover, that was, uh, that was a big deal, you know, back then. And uh, I'm very proud of it. And, you know, I have one uh, in my apartment on display and... Uh, you know, I'm very proud of the things that I did. Oh, yeah, no, and you've done a lot of stuff. I mean, you were like a regular on the Michael Douglas show. Like, I, I watched some on YouTube, and I remember 
even when I was a kid seeing you on there, and I always used to see you everywhere. I mean, every time I turn on the TV, whether I saw you on Michael Douglas or in a commercial, I was like, well, you were like everywhere at one time. Yeah, I mean, Mike was great because, you know, he, he was on from 4th, in New York anyway, I don't know the rest of the country, but in New York he was on from 4.30 to 6 o'clock, it was a 90-minute show, and millions and millions and millions of, of young people and housewives and mothers and fathers, you know, all would come home from after work or would be home watching the kids during the day, and they would watch that show. So, you know, my my fan base literally went into the millions of people, you know, once I started doing, you know, the Mike Douglas show, and uh, I, I'm very thankful for that. Oh, yeah, no, that that's a, you like like his sidekick for, like, how many shows were you on exactly? Well, I, I did a, I did a total of twenty nine episodes, but I was on the show. I was a co-host on the show for three different weeks. Wow! So, yeah. you know, and that's five shows a piece. So, I also did the show another fourteen times uh, after that. So, uh huh. Yeah, I I remember a lot of them. I mean, it's been a long time because I was a kid myself back then. Sure. I was, sure. But uh, I remember seeing you know, that I had black and white TV back then because, you know, that was uh, the 70s. And, that's um, right, that's right. I, I we had a little 19-inch in the house, the one that I, like, kicked over a million times, and we needed, like, a, a pliers to change the channel. I used to have to stick the pliers uh, in there. Unbelievable, unbelievable, <laughs> huh? And it was only, you know, a couple of channels. And let me tell you, let me tell you, if you had a color TV, you were, like, considered to be a rich person. Exactly. I mean, if you had a color TV, you were upper class, you know. Uh, when, when my uncle Marco, he was the only one who was making real money in my family, and yeah. when he bought a, a color TV from my grandma's house, like we would like couldn't wait to wake up and and uh, run to grandma's house and watch the cartoons in color, you know. Oh, I, listen, absolutely. I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, when we got our very first answering machine. Ah, uh, you know, yeah. And the answering machine was like the size of the whole table. It was <laughs> huge, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, just, it's amazing. And then, you know, I think to myself, oh, my God, how did we ever live without answering machines? And then I thought I know. to myself, and then I thought to myself later, how did we ever live without a cell phone? And then after right. that, I thought to myself, how did we ever live without email? I mean, you know, it's just, it's just it's the way just, it is, man. Technology is incredible. Yeah, it's the truth because, I mean, I used to, you know, I, even in the days when me and you used to hang out at the China Club, I, used to, I had no cell phone. I don't even think they were out yet in the 80s and 90s. No, not, not in the very beginning of China Club, no. Uh, no. no, there were no cell phones at that point. And, yeah. um, you know, you should tell people a little bit about what the China Club was for the people oh, yeah. who are listening out there who, you know, unfortunately never got to experience it. Absolutely. The China Club is actually when me and Mason met back in 1985, and the China Club was on West 75th and Broadway. Yes. And it was a place that if 200 people were hanging out, I would say 100 of them were celebrities, the actors. Yeah, yeah and pretty much. Musicians, uh, uh, models, uh, industry people. As like you know, you, you'd be. I, mean, I played there. Mason played there. And you'd be on the stage playing, and you have people like you know what Bruce Willis hanging out in the audience, and and uh, Howard Stern, and it's like Julian Lennon. All these kind of guys were hanging out, and uh, me and Mason, you know, we know everybody. We had we had a big click over there, right, Mason? Well, I mean, I, I, absolutely, and it, it was really a magical time, you know. I mean, literally, you know, in one corner would be Eddie Murphy with his entourage, and then, you know, Sylvester Stallone would walk in, and Bruce Willis would hop over the bar and start to bartend. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, Stevie Wonder would get up and jam. Steve Winwood would get up and jam. David Bowie would get up and jam. You know, it was really just one of those magical things in New York that will never happen again. And, I know. You know, to, to, to say that you experienced it live and in person and were there, I mean, some of the stories that I tell people, their mouths just like drop to the floor, and they're like, "You're kidding me! That never happened." I said, "Oh yeah, it happened. Believe me, it happened." <laughs> you know, I mean, just Mike Tyson would be hanging out, you know, Billy Idol, and one, just just an incredible time in in the history of you know New York club life, you know, and you, know, uh, you and I were both there, man. Yeah, I mean, we we just your life alone would probably take about a hundred shows before anybody could. <laughs> yeah, you know? not only the China China Club alone would need a hundred shows. That's not including your personal life before the China Club. 
Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah, but I got to tell you, though, you know, that was a, uh, you know, when Shuttlecoat first opened up, I was only 20. I was young. And, you know, it was just, it was such a beautiful experience for me. Uh, and, and really, all this time later, I mean, we're talking 28 years later, as you pointed out, you know, those memories are so important to me in my life and oh. have really shaped, you know, the human being that I am today and mm-hmm. what I do today and what I, you know, how I make my money today and all the, all my experiences really were, were really formed from the China club, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and speaking of the China club, I mean, Mason partners with our, uh, with our brother, Chris, our friend, Chris, and you have your, your club in the village in the city where they they have China Club reunions and I was at the uh, not the last one because I would say right, right. one before that. So the China Club we really still kind of keep it alive but now in your place. Yeah, uh, the 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 original general manager of the China Club, a guy named Chris, uh he and I own a, a great little pub down on Avenue A in the East Village. Uh it's called Destination Bar and um we've had it for about four and a half years now. And pretty much, you know, I would say twice a year, we try to throw a little reunion for the China Club people who are still alive and still around. Um, you know, a lot of them are old and really don't like to go out anymore and things like that. But the people that do show up, man, we have a lot of fun. We really do. And yeah. the last one, we had about 40 people show up, which is uh, pretty good. Uh, not as many as the night you were there. I, I would say about 70 people were at that one. But uh, they knew the mayor people, to be you know there, so they all playing, you know. Well, they knew you, the mayor of rock and roll, of course, you know. And that's one of the extra people. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> no, listen, man. People love you. They remember you, man. You were you were a fixture there. I mean, uh, they might as well have had a cot in the back with your name on it. You know, you were there so much. Yeah, I was there almost every night of the week, seven nights a week. I mean, even when I was sick, I was still, you know, so so focused and going out and making contacts and meeting people at and I would still go there with 104 fever and sit there and, like, sit at that couch on the top by the uh, coat check. Right, and right. Just because I felt like I didn't want to miss out on anything. You know? Well, and, and that was the incredible thing, is that if you did miss a night there, you really would think to yourself, oh, man, what could I possibly have missed? You know, who would have gotten up on stage tonight and played? You know, did, did uh did... You know, did did Jagger get up and perform? Did Bowie get up and perform? You know, what might have happened? And that just doesn't happen anymore. And it's it not like that anymore. That happened to me. I mean, a few times I remember I was with my guitar player, and we were in the village. I said, come on, let's go to the China Club. Nah, let's just hang out in the village tonight. Okay. Then yeah. the next day, I hear Jimmy Page and Robert Plant was there. And yeah. so that's alone. I'm like, I want to, like, kill my... my I, I got to tell you, Sal, I missed that night, too. <laughs> and I and I missed the night that Stevie Wonder got up, and I missed the night that uh, that Bowie got up. I, I, and, I you missed know, a, I missed a lot of those, nights. And a lot of those now, see, Mason's mentioning in each individual, but a lot of those nights in the China Club, they were all on the stage at the same time. Oh, absolutely, yes, yes, yes. You know, yes, exactly. I mean, people think it's just one person at a time. It was Bowie, uh, Nile Rogers, yeah, uh, you absolutely, know, and Bruce Willis. I I have pictures of nights where like. You know, five, six different superstars were up on the stage jam. I mean, where were you going to see that? You got Paul Stanley from Kiss uh, up there with, uh, you know, uh, the drummer from uh, Enough's Enough and uh, David Bowie and Robert Gordon and yeah, all these yeah. Things, huh? You know, I mean, it was. Uh, I mean, I would. In, in my wildest dreams, I don't think I could ever, you know, uh, own a club and recreate that again. It just won't. It'll never happen again. But you know. We were young, and we were there, and we had great memories because of it. So the it's, time uh, was, it's all know. time. It's like, you know, the China Club was like the Beatles as a band. It only happens one time, you know? Right. But I've got to tell you what, though, Sal. You were, you were ahead of, of everyone. You were ahead of everyone, and I'll tell you why. I don't know anyone else other than you who walked around that club with a camera. <laughs> and you walked around with a camera and you took photos and tons of them. And I wish, in retrospect, looking back, 30 years later almost, I and, wish that I had done that. And I wish that they had digital cameras back then because 
Back then, I had one of those regular 35 millimeter cameras where you take, uh, you know, 32 pictures or 12 pictures, and you had to go to the photo mat. Uh, of course, of course. And wait for, I hope that they came out good, you know, because now, you know, you, you would get like 12 pictures, and like 10 of them had their heads cut off, and two of them were good, and he's like, you're stuck with these pictures. No, oh, listen, you know, there, there were no camera phones, uh, you know, built into cell phones back then, <laughs> you know. Exactly. I mean, nowadays, digital ones. It's, so, it's so easy to do that kind of thing, but you were ahead of the curve, man. You were you were way ahead of everyone by doing that, i got to tell you. I think in my mind I knew that this is some stuff that I want to always have, and I know that 20 years later I'll be able to show some. I mean, who knows about Facebook and my right, face right. Sure. share these pictures with the world. I never thought of that, but I just wanted to have these pictures to share with my friends and family at home. Right. I was Oh, I was hanging out last night with David Bowie, and he calls me Salvador. Yeah, you're right. right. You were hanging out with Bowie. And show him the picture. Like, oh, my God, he wasn't right. getting this. Real, right. You know? And then in, in seconds, we're going to go to a commercial now, and we'll oh, be okay. right Hold that note, Mason. We'll be right back. We're going to a commercial. You got it, brother. Okay. Here is a well-documented fact. Humans spend approximately 33% of life in bed. That's a good reason to consider bringing your bed into the 21st century with Function All Linens. They'll change your bedtime forever. Designed for every kind of bedtime you can imagine, these fun and functional bed sheets have his and her side pockets that hold pretty much everything but the kitchen sink. The pockets allow you to have your cell phone, iPad, remotes, and anything else you need within your fingertips reach at all times. No more cluttered nightstands. No more fumbling around in the dark. Simply reach for your pocket. Experience the affordable comfort and pure luxury that only Function All Linens can offer. For more information or to order, visit FunctionAll-Linens.com or BedDazzle.com. Does this sound like you? You want an online interior design business that puts money in the bank and even makes you money 24-7. You have the design skills, but you're unsure about the online business part. Or maybe you already have an e-decorating business, but the web traffic trickles in and the sales are slow. It seems like you'll never harness the power of the Internet, and your dream of a successful online business feels out of reach. If you have plenty of unanswered questions and you're searching for reliable answers, look no further. Introducing the e-decorating missing manual. This is a step-by-step proven plan to create a thriving online interior decorating business. It includes digital learning materials from an info-packed PDF manual to instructional videos. Get it today at MuppleBee.com. That's www.MuppleBee.com. Well, it looks like uh, we're going to be heading to MuppleBee.com tonight. i got to check that out. (laughs) Back, and uh, we have Brother Mason Reese, a legend, the uh, acting and... uh, Feel the the acting, just everything, musician, actor. Yeah, 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 you know. You know, entrepreneur. Hey, Mason, you know, yeah. uh, oh, made a movie. Didn't they make a movie about you called Whatever Happened to Mason Reese? Was that, is that the name? Yeah, yeah, this guy, Brett Ratner, uh, who's a big Hollywood director now, made a movie uh, about me as an NYU graduate project. Mm-hmm. It was like his thesis project, you know, to end his school. And... Uh, Without, you know, making a very, very, very long story short, um, you know, he, he's a bit of a scumbag who owes me a lot of money. <laughs> oh, no, you, you know, you're kidding. You're not telling me you didn't get paid for that. Oh, I never got paid a dime, my friend. Oh. And, and, and I signed a contract to say that if it was used in any professional capacity, that I would be compensated for that. And every rush hour DVD and every rush hour VCR tape you buy or rent, my movie is on that tape. It's on that DVD. The, the I full movie or just the trailer? What? The full movie or the, or the no, trailer? It was, it was only a five and a half minute movie, a six minute movie. Oh, I thought it was a full length movie. I didn't know that. No, okay. no, no. It, was a, it was an NYU graduate, you know, a short, like a five and a half, six minute short. But, oh, gosh, gotcha, gotcha. But nonetheless, I didn't get paid for it. And uh, consequently, I have nothing but the lowest human regard for Brett Ratner. Wow. Now you also, and I have Rush Hour DVDs sealed. I didn't even open it yet. I have all three of them, so I got to open that up and watch well, it. Well, take a look at Rush Hour One, my friend, and you will see. If you look at the extras, 
in the wow. extra section on the DVD, you will see not only the, the movie, but you'll see a narrated version of the movie where Brett Ratner talks about how he decided to do what he did, and blah, blah, blah. But what he doesn't tell you is, is that there was another director named Brett Carr who did 90% of the work. Wow. But, got, but, got, but none of the glory and none of the acclaim for it. And how does that end up on the Rush Hour DVD as an extra? I don't, I don't understand. Oh, did he direct Rush Hour? Uh, of course he did. Ah, he's a, he's, a big, he's a big muckety muck in Hollywood now, getting paid seven million a picture. Oh boy! All and right, uh, you know that two fifty will get me on the subway. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, maybe we're, we're gonna have to write a new script or something like that. And uh, Tom, well, listen, listen. Now, I'm, I think I told you I'm going out to L.A. in January for five weeks. I just put together a production company out there. I created about a half a dozen different TV show ideas. And we're going to go out and shoot a couple of what they call sizzle reels, which are like little four-minute movies that kind of show you and show the network executives exactly how your show is going to look and feel. And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe uh, in a year's time I'll be back on TV again. Well, hopefully, I'll, hopefully I'll be casted in these uh, films that you're making. That would be a wonderful thing. I well, remember... Uh, what, what I remember, you, one of them you're not right for, but that's okay. Maybe one of the other ones. <laughs> I remember back in the 80s when me and you were always hanging out that you and your mom had an idea for some show, and you were thinking about you casting me in it. I remember something like that. You remember yeah. talking about Yeah. Do you I remember, remember that, that, Mason? I, of course I remember. I, you know, I'm not that old, dude. You know. Yeah, you I'm know, not, I, I don't I, remember. I'm, I'm, I'm senile, but I'm not that senile. You know. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if you remember the conversation because... Uh, you know, I remember it like it was yesterday. That's the funny thing about those days to me. It doesn't feel like 28, 30 years ago. No, 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 it doesn't, man. I mean, I I have such vivid memories of, of things that happened to me back in that part of my life. Because, quite honestly, I consider that to be a golden point in my life, you know, really, truly. And, uh, you know, I, I look back lovingly, you know, with about those times. Well, at that time, changed my life completely. I, I was, you know, a cat from uh, Brooklyn and Queens, and I really never, I mean, I went to Manhattan to, uh, you know, whatever, not for, I, if I had to go to the city, it was for something like, you know, get my passport to, take, to go to Italy or whatever. But, yeah, yeah. you know, I never went to clubs, and I had a friend of mine, Richie, he told me about the China Club, and when I went there, that one night changed my whole life. You know, that Incred was it. Incredible, isn't it? And I walked into there, and, and I started meeting celebrities there one after, I had never met anyone. I mean, it, not, never, not one celebrity I had ever met until I walked into the China Club. Right. Yeah. The closest person to a celebrity I met in those days was uh, uh, Frank Carrillo, who was on Atlantic Records. He produced two of my songs. Oh, wow. And that's the closest celebrity I knew who had somebody who had a record out. You know, that's the, right. the, you know. But Frank Carrillo, you know, he, he's still out there doing stuff. And uh, he was not a superstar. He was not a big rock star. But he did have a, a record contract on Atlantic. So yeah. that was wild just for me, you know. But let's get back to sure. Mason. Yeah, yeah. Here I am about myself. I mean, what am I doing here? That's all right. <laughs> you're, the, you're the mayor of rock and roll, baby. Uh-huh. This is true. This is true. See, that's one thing I like, love about Brother Mason. You sure do know your stuff, brother. <laughs> uh, listen, you know, I'm, 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 I'm slightly educated. I know what I'm talking uh-huh. about. Now, you, haven't you also wrote books? Well, I mean, I wrote a book about my life when I was seven years old <laughs> called The Memoirs of Mason Reese. You know, now you may ask yeah. yourself, holy I crap, can't... what the hell do you have to talk about when you're seven years old? But I can't believe you even wrote a book at seven years old. That's incredible. I mean, yeah, you but... are definitely uh, 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 you know, a grown-up in, in a small person's body because you were... Well, that's what you everyone were... used to say about me, that I, you know, people didn't think I was really a kid. They actually thought that like I was like a grown midget, you know, pretending to be a kid. And you, you know, know because, so, you know. Yeah, I mean, some of the things that I said and some of the things I ca- that came out of my mouth to this day, I, I, I wonder how the hell did I say that? I mean, what was I thinking at the time that made me say something so outrageous, so you know, adult, really, for, for lack of a better term, you know. Yeah, I even watched uh, recently on YouTube the uh, scene with you and Michael Douglas where you got really emotional and the, you actually broke out and started crying. Well, you know, th- there was not a lot of stuff on me on YouTube until just recently. I put on like about a dozen videos um, that uh, up until like a week and a half ago really were never seen in the last 25 years. 
They had right. been seen by the public in, in you know since the early seventies, so thirty five years. Okay. So how did you have that? What did you have that on film? I mean, you didn't have videos, uh, VHS or DVDs back in those days. How did no. you save? No, what they had, Sal, they had a they had a format, and they called it three quarter inch video. Mm. And the player for the, for this three quarter inch video, and I, I, I'm not lying to you, Sal. The thing weighed about a hundred pounds, and it was probably three feet by two feet. Okay. That, that's how big this thing was, and it took industrial videotape, three quarter inch wide videotape. Now. 30 years later, my father had them transferred onto half-inch videotape. Mm. Then, about five years ago, a friend of mine transferred them from half-inch onto DVD. Wow. And then I uploaded them from DVD onto YouTube. And I've been waiting five years to do it, quite honestly. But so many of my friends have been telling me, Oh man, I loved you on the Mike Douglas show. You got to put that stuff on, you know, on YouTube, blah blah blah. And I picked out like twelve or fourteen clips that I thought were just a lot of fun, mm-hmm. you know, really interesting things that would catch your attention. And uh, you know, people are watching them, so I love it. Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, like, it's true because I've always went to, you know, check out your stuff and then I, I had never seen the Michael Douglas stuff on YouTube. I know you were on there because I right. remember it seeing you, but that was never on there until recently, and you're absolutely right. You, you must have just put it up a few weeks ago or something, right? Yeah, and I'm loving it. You know, I'm getting a lot of fun response from it. Uh, uh, you know, all my friends on Facebook are, are subscribing to my YouTube channel now, which is a lot of fun. Um, right. You know, listen, man, it's just... I'm proud of what I did. You know, it's a long time ago. I'm a very different person now, but I'm very proud of what I did. And you're still doing great things. Now, I also been talking to you that you are, are going to be managing your niece. Yes. A, yeah, she's, a, she's an aspiring pop singer. Uh, she's a beautiful girl with a lovely voice. And she's coming to New York in, in uh, about three or four days. We're sitting down with a couple of uh, engineers and producers here in New York. Uh, I've got someone over at BMG that would like to listen to her when we have a, you know, an EP created. Um, I like a bunch of your songs that you've written, so hopefully we can uh, we can sneak a few of those onto the EP. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, and this is all for those of you who are listening. This is how this all came about. This is me and Mason been talking about this for the past week about songs and and uh, I forgot to tell him that I was launching my very first internet radio show this Friday. So I said, hey, Mason, how about you being my first guest? And I was lucky enough to hear Brother Mason say, of course I'll do it. Sure. I mean, how many how many people out there have a first internet radio show or even a cable talk show and get a guy like Brother Mason Reese for the first time, right? Well, what, what am I going to say? I can't say no to you, Uncle Sal. You've been around, man. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say no to you. But yeah, I'm also honored that you are on the air with me because you are a superstar, child star. You've done so uh, much. Thank you, brother. Compared to, uh, I mean, I branched out there. I was 27 years old when I started making my mark. You were like four years old and you were already a superstar. Yeah, you know? yeah, man. By the, time, by the time I was 14, I was washed up already. No, well, you took a good shower, but you weren't washed up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, exactly. And, uh... But uh, this sounds great because I've seen the pictures you sent me. Of Lucy. She is a really pretty girl, and I see she has different looks, black hair. And yeah, some... yeah, she lo- she loves to fool around with different colors in her hair. She's got, you know, adorable face. She's got the most beautiful blue eyes. You yeah, know, I know. Well, I saw the, uh, the pictures with the blue eyes and the black hair. I'm like, wow. I mean, she's yeah, like... no, and she's got a great look. She's young. She's pretty, smart girl, got a good head on her shoulders. Uh, yeah. her, her her name is Lissa, L-I-S-S-A, Knight, K-N-I-G-H-T. Uh, I'm going to be putting up a Facebook profile for her, a Twitter account for her. We're going to be doing a lot of things for her. So, Is, is there any uh, anything on YouTube with her? Just like maybe no, not, right, not yet. Not yet, but there will be. Well, well, you know what we'll do, Mason? We'll do a show with her, too, if she wants to be interviewed and, and you know, she can promote herself out there. You know? I would love it. She's, we're we're going to have her come. She's coming into town in a couple of days. And then we're going to have her come back in the early spring of next year, and that's when we're going to record the EP and uh, put together the Twitter and the YouTube and the Facebook and the whole thing. 
and uh, God willing, you know, you're, you're still rocking and rolling on the internet. We'll we'll do something. Absolutely, absolutely, man. And um, okay, well, look at this. It's nine twenty-eight. We have two minutes left. This show just flew by. It really uh, is, huh? It's incredible. Isn't it incredible? I mean, to cover some of the stuff. I mean, we haven't even covered a, a speck of the stuff you have done. Listen, we, 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 we didn't talk. We didn't talk about any stories or any of the things that we saw that uh, you know. Uh, uh, Maybe weren't so good, you know, the I'm, things that we saw. We definitely have to do another show. You, would you like to do that? We definitely got to do another sure. show. With you. We didn't even talk about I wanted to get into talking about There's so much to talk about, and so little time is half hour. It's hard to do. Yeah, that. half hour goes by very fast, man. It goes by very fast. All right. Uh, were, you, oh. were you there? Were you in China Club the night that Billy Idol smacked two chicks in the face? Uh, well, yes, yes, I was standing right next to him. Yeah, and, uh, he, he, so was I. <laughs> I was standing right next to him, and uh, he, he, uh, he, I said to him, he, he, a girl came over, she went, oh, my God, Billy Idol, oh, my God, Billy Idol. And he hit her in the face, and she fell down. I said, oh, my, I said, what the hell did you do that for? I said to him, he goes, he said to me, I don't like being disturbed when I'm talking to me friends. Yeah, <laughs> well. And he okay. hurt Julian Lennon's feelings that night, too. I don't even know if I should get into that. But maybe well, we'll talk about it. and Julian's a sweetheart, so I don't know, you know. Yeah, so, and he is. And I was pissed at Billy Idol, and then I, Shannon took him away, and we can't even talk about what happened that night with Shannon yeah. and Billy Idol. There you <laughs> go. Exactly. <laughs> but it's 930, Mason, so with this, I guess this show is, uh, we could call this a wrap. And uh, thank you, Mason, brother. I love you, man, uh, for doing the show. I love you, too, my brother. And um, we'll definitely do another one, and I'll probably talk to you later after the show. All right. Rock and roll, baby. All right. Thanks, Mason. You got it, man. Okay. That's the end of the Mayor of Rock and Roll shows, but tune in hopefully next week or the week after, and we'll be back. Cheers, folks. Thank you for listening. This has been a Mathis Media Hub production.